Who were the saviors uh, the, who came forward to save the airline uh, during the time of COVID? Right, so obviously at the time, government had no cash, couldn't help us. Did you ever have that, uh, have that moment where you became the bad boss in order to get an outcome or achieve an outcome? I, I was only with respect to a bunch of expatriates. The CEO of Qantas, uh, his salary was a public knowledge and his let's use yes. salaries public knowledge. Why not Fiji Airways? Well, they earn salaries that I could dream of. Hello and welcome to the Lens at 177 and today we are out of the office and we are at the head office of Fiji Airways and joining us today for the first time ever, the Managing Director and CEO of uh, Fiji Airways, Andre Filion. Welcome to the program, sir. Let's Thank you. Nice to meet you. Andy. Let's begin by knowing you first. Uh, a little bit of background, uh, uh, personality, uh, uh, a little bit of background of yourself. yourself yeah, so I'm um, South African born. My father is South African, mother Italian, so I've got a good mix of Latin in me. And um, I, you need in South Africa, I've got an honours degree in accounting and commerce and I'm a chartered accountant by profession. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the airline industry for almost 50 years, uh, of which I've spent um, 14 years with a company called Come in South Africa. It's second to South African Airways and it would fly most of what we call the trunk routes feeding Johannesburg, Cape Town and Durban, which are the three main routes. And um, after I was with Comair, I joined SA Express, which is owned by South African Airways and it's their feeder airline that operated turboprop aircraft. And then eventually I became the CFO and then CEO of South African Airways. And I held the CEO role for nearly five years. Mm. Very interesting uh, uh, information that uh, the late and great Nelson Mandela called you up personally to yes. take over the company of uh, South African Airways. Yes, so in 1994, when uh, he came to power, uh, they had an American CEO at the time who left the company and I was asked uh, by Nelson himself if I would consider taking up the role. So I was very proud. Uh, and I, there's a little bit of a story of how that happened. Uh, one Saturday morning driving in the car with my wife, we had a disc jockey at the time, um, he's a radio jockey, who used to prank people because he could imitate Nelson Mandela's voice. Mm. And he would call people and say Madiba talking and they'd get all excited and then once they excited, he'd say, ho ho, you've been whacked because his name was Wacked Simpson. Mm. So we're driving and the phone rings and there's this voice and it's Nelson Mandela, Madiba, saying Andre, said Andre, and my wife said, don't answer, it's Wacked Simpson, you're going to be made an idiot of. And she kept saying it and he kept trying to talk and eventually he said, who's next to you? And I said, my wife, he says, oh, he said, look, here's my address, just come to my house. So we went there and it was him. So as we walked in, he turned to my wife and said, you've been whacked. So it was quite a laugh. But um, yes, he you know, asked me if I'd be prepared to take on the role. And I'd been, as I say, with Comair and SA Express before that for many years. So I had the experience. And this was soon after the country was coming out of apartheid? Yes, that was within a year of uh, apartheid ending. I understand you also served in the military uh, yes, so, in the country? So all um, young white South Africans that were 18 were conscripted into the army and we had to serve and at the time South Africa was on full-scale full -scale war in Angola mm. against um, Russian and Cuban supported armies there. Mm. So it was eight years and we did two years full-time and then the rest we went for camps every six months for three months mm. and we had a, you know we were on the border it was active combat mm. and you are karate uh, expert yes I so i've got five black belts in karate mm. and uh, i always joke and say the military experience that made us aggressive and then um, generally um, with the karate, I was quite an uh, aggressive young guy mm -hmm. and thought I was a great leader because I was a tormentor. Mm -hmm. And then uh, after that, I got a lesson to change. And uh, the lesson was I met my wife and she's a neurosemantics trainer, mm -hmm. psychologist. And on our second date, we were driving 
and there was this very slow driver in front of me blocking the traffic and I started getting upset and venting in the car and uh, she just quietly watched me and as I overtook she turned to me and said so Andre tell me do you think he heard you and of course I was a real idiot at the time um, and she said to me you know you've taken a lot of poison there and the only one suffering is you and I really think you've got an emotional control problem so anyhow when we eventually I dropped her off at the end of the day she turned to me and said I want you to do a test called the Baron EQ test it's an American test you do online and it tests your emotional intelligence and it came back and she said the rating I got is that of an emotional cripple so she recommended that if we're going to get together going forward I needed to do emotions 101 I needed to do NLP all these programs to improve emotions mm -hmm. And I did them. Mm. And there's a very famous psychologist called Ken Wilber that says in life you need to sometimes wake up, uh, then grow up, then clean up, and then show up. And so all this cognitive psychology type programs I did to improve my emotional control was my wake up, clean up, grow up. And and basically I've shown up a better person so today I consider myself as a leader as a coach and not a leader as a tormentor so the Andre who came to join Fiji Airways was that a tormentor Andre or he changed Andre? Und undoubtedly the Andre that was leader as a coach because what I forgot to mention on my background is after South African Airways I then became the CEO of Air Mauritius where I was CEO for 10 years Mm. And uh, um, at South African Airways and in Mauritius, I was involved in turnaround of the businesses because they were both troubled businesses. Mm -hmm. So I came here as a CEO with turnaround experience and with um, a very gentle nature as leader, as a coach. Mm. Why is it important for a person to have a personality like you to lead an airline? Right, because airlines are very complex businesses and constantly subjected to storms you know the uh, the market is very volatile you've got one of your major costs which is fuel it's roughly 40 50 percent of your cost that is volatile you can't control it you can only try and hedge it to a, a certain extent so a very tough business a lot of competition and in fact in the last 15 years more than a hundred small airlines the size of Fiji Airways have disappeared and they've disappeared because small airlines have a challenge business model mm -hmm. and uh, that's why it's a tough business mm -hmm. So when you arrived here, what did you find on the plate that needed fixing quickly? So, so first of all, what I found is we were ranked 100 in the world by Skytrax. Now Skytrax is a leading rating agency. There are two in the world. There's Skytrax and Apex that rate airlines. And we were rated 100 in the world and a two and a half star service standard airline, which is very, very low. Our competitors at the time, which is in New Zealand, and Qantas, for example, were four-star. And um, so we weren't uh, competitive at all. And also what I found is that the company had gone through a turnaround process, but a lot of the core requirements hadn't been addressed. So I always joke and say when I peeled up the veneer, I saw underneath that there was a lot of work that had to be done. Mm. And I must tell you why. I'd been sold. So when, when I was interviewed, they were looking for a mature CEO and they told me this was my holiday job. And they said, everything's perfect here, you just need to come in and relax. Mm. Wasn't quite the story. Okay. Mm. What about the work, work, work culture back then? Uh, what, what, what? How did you find the work? Well, I, I must say the one positive of the company was the people. I met people with a lot of grit. Now grit is defined as people with passion, with resilience, adaptability, um, uh, very strong individuals. And, and that impressed me. So we had good people. You just had an infrastructure that needed a lot of work. Mm. And also to, to harness the best out of those people. Mm. And that's the challenge I found when I joined. Did you ever have that, uh, have that moment where you became the bad boss in order to get an outcome or achieve an outcome? I, I was only with respect to a bunch of expatriates. So when I got here, we had um, 14 expatriate leaders 
and about five of them I found in the first six months were focused on their own interests rather than those of the business. Mm. So I terminated them all. Mm. Was that difficult or was that something that needed to be done? They had to be done. Mm. And I also found that the focus on transformation wasn't at the level it should be. Mm. Because the way expatriates are employed, you brought in with an understanding that you would be transforming and lifting up a local over time to replace you in the job. Mm. And, and I didn't quite see that commitment. Mm. And these particular five individuals over time, as I say, over a six month period, I got them out of the company. Uh, so the succession plan is in the company uh, from back then, uh, during your time? Uh, yes, so, so from then till now, we've had 11 expatriates um, senior, what we call executive managers or chiefs, replaced by locals, and five senior managers replaced by locals. Mm. Let's talk about the Fiji Airways fleet uh, when you came in. Yes. What stock you had back then, and what do you have now? And is it satisfactory to your uh, performance of a company? Yes. So at the time when I joined, they recently added um, three Airbus A330 200s, which are good aircraft. And there was a 330-300 on lease. But then they had five very old 737-800s. These, some of them were 20 years old. So there had to be a, a fleet replacement we had to do on the 737s, but the Airbuses were about five, six years old when I joined. Mm -hmm. So they were reasonably new. Mm -hmm. The Fiji Link domestic service. So, so if I just carry on, okay. so where's the fleet today? Yes. So today we have um, four Airbus A350s, which is the widely recognized as the best aircraft you can buy um, out there. So we're very happy with them. We've also upgraded our 737s to the 737 MAX. Mm. Now the 350s and the MAXs are what we call new generation aircraft. They're far more fuel efficient. Um, they've got composite um, uh, components and, and wings on the, on the aircraft, so they're lighter, they carry more cargo, they fly faster. So we have, in terms of the 737, which is our regional fleet, and our long-haul um, A350s, the best you can get. Mm -hmm. Fiji Link uh, domestic services yes. uh, that's on offer. Uh, uh, why is Fiji Link important to Fiji Airways? So Fiji Link is the domestic airline, and it feeds traffic onto our international services and from our international services to various destinations in the country like Savu Savu, Tabuni, Kandavu. So very important. Um, it's only 5% of the revenue of the group. But in terms of passengers, it's 300,000 out of 1.7 million. So it's got a much bigger share of the passenger feed. So a very important part of our business. And here's an interesting fact. It flies about 16,000 flights a year, whereas Fiji Airways International is only 10,000 flights a year. So very active, small, domestic airline. Very important to us. Andre, we'll take a short break and we'll continue our discussion on the other side. We were around when the deed was first signed. We were around when the first car engine roared. We were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. Welcome back, and today we are speaking to the CEO and MD of Fiji Airways. Uh, Andre, uh, let me ask you, uh, many people don't know, Fiji Airways has a stake in some resorts here in Fiji. Please explain. So yes, Anish, we, we own um, currently 38.5% of um, what everyone knows as a Sofitel and Denera. It's a company called Richmond that uh, owns it, and we're in the process of increasing that to 50%. So very important for us, a great investment for the company. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about the passenger, passenger uh, uh, hold uh, into Fiji and out of Fiji uh, compared to Qantas in New Zealand. How is Fiji always faring currently? Yes, so, so we bring in 70% of all the traffic, or what we call passengers, into 
Fiji, which is predominantly tourists, and there's an element of what we call VFR, visiting friends and relatives, mm -hmm. that's families, and a little bit of, the, of business traffic, but the, it's predominantly leisure traffic, mm -hmm. holiday makers coming in, and we're 70%. So we play, we're very strategic to the company, country in terms of tourism. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine you are the CEO of Qantas or Air New Zealand. What would you be thinking now to counter Fiji Airways? Well, well here's the positive. Um, at the Skytrax Awards uh, this year, we were rated best airline to the Pacific, better than Qantas and better than Air New Zealand. And in fact, we recently heard that one of them uh, mentioned in a meeting that uh, the benchmark they need to beat is now Fiji Airways. So what, a, what an accolade for us. I mean, I remember when I joined here, we are two and a half star airline. Today we're four star and five star. Um, they were the icons we were trying to beat. Mm -hmm. And what an amazing reversal. So my question remains, what would the CEO of Qantas be thinking now in order to beat you? I heard they saying we're getting too big for our boots. And uh, so you know what, they haven't seen our boots yet. They can make it even bigger. Yeah. Fiji is a brand, uh, international brand. Yes. Uh, how about, uh, what does the company do to grow that brand? So, so we're very active in destination marketing. I always say we're the ambassador around the world. We're the first encounter a tourist that gets on our flight has with country Fiji. And we've made sure our service standard, the welcome when you get on board, we welcome you to our home, is very special. And so around the world we have an outstanding brand and of course the livery of our aircraft. Everyone talks about it. There isn't an airport you go to when that aircraft's standing there that people don't say, wow, what an incredible livery. So between the livery, our approach in service standard, and the active marketing we do in every market. So here's an interesting fact. This year we're going to be spending, for the, by the end of December, 61 million in destination marketing. And Tourism Fiji only spends 19 million. And that's why we work closely in partnership with them, so we combine our, our resources out there. Mm. It's all good to bring in a large number of tourists into the country uh, via airlines, but what about our resources, uh, the hotels, the yes. airports? Uh, uh, do you see concern in those areas? Very much so. So our biggest concern going forward is, you know, our, one of our key uh, strategic objectives is to keep growing the airline, keep growing tourists coming in. But our constraints are hotel rooms. Today we believe there's a shortage of about 5,000 rooms. And secondly, is the airport infrastructure is struggling. Mm. So there's discussion going on? Are, yes, are, are, you, are you involved in discussion? So of course Investment Fiji is doing a lot of work to attract new investment of hotels mm -hmm. and uh, we obviously assist wherever we can and with the airports I'm very happy with the new CEO Masake who is doing a great job mm -hmm. and we're working closely together to assist wherever we can to help improve the infrastructure mm -hmm. at the airport. Okay. This is Nandi Airport. Yes. Yeah? Uh, explain to us the air services agreement that allows uh, Fiji Airways to fly in and out yes. of countries and how does the business of air services agreement work? Yes. So first of all you've got to distinguish international from domestic. Mm -hmm. So for domestic um, there is a regulation if you want to fly domestically that you have to have the competencies and there's a licensing board. Mm -hmm. International is a, a sovereign agreement country to country. Mm -hmm. So Fiji has an agreement with Australia, it's another one with New Zealand. And these sovereign agreements called air service agreements allow for reciprocal flying rights. And they're either liberal or they are restrictive or they open skies. And that regulates how airlines fly between the countries. Mm. You're happy with uh, the agreements uh, Fiji Airways got with Australia and New Zealand? Yes, so, so obviously they vary. In the case of Australia, it's a seat restricted agreement that gives us 7,900 seats and it gives the Australians 6,900 seats. And that's partially to protect us against two large markets mm -hmm. where they're very dominant and big players and, and to give Fiji Airways some level of uh, protection going forward. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, for example, with New Zealand, it's an open skies arrangement. They, they aren't quite the same restrictions. 
the open sky system, uh, anybody, whoever yeah. wants to fly in out of Fiji, they can yes. do that, but that's not uh, happening now? No. So, so this is a very interesting discussion. You know, this suits the big airlines. So we say the major airlines love open skies because they can do what they like, when they like, how they like, and they have the resources to do it. But when you're a small airline like Fiji Airways, you need protection against that. So the Emirates and, and the Qatars and the Etihads, which are six freedom carriers, where they don't bring a lot of people from their home base. They pick it up in the country, go through their home base, and then bring it to, like, for example, Fiji, would um, have a, de a really, I would say, catastrophic impact on an airline like Fiji Airways. Mm -hmm. And government's aware of that. We have a strategic value to the country, which we're, I'm sure you'll ask about. But um, in order to protect us against these large carriers, mm. which want open skies, it's important that you don't have open skies. Mm. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence that proves it's never worked mm. for small uh, small countries. Mm. And, and I know that, for example, in Mauritius, we've seen the impact that you've had with open skies. Mm. Are you aware of any lobbying by any countries uh, in Asia or, or, or Middle East well, they, through they, government? They constantly lobby. Mm. But we, for example, with Emirates, uh, we've done a, 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 an MOU with Dubai in order that we can work together and that there will be a way that we can cooperate but without a, a full open skies arrangement. But remember, these are government decisions. Mm. The airline can encourage government uh, to have an approach. Mm. And then we encourage them to have a controlled liberalization approach. So if the government wants to bring in another airline uh, uh, from outside, they, yes. they, w they would want... government's choice. Government's choice, and yes. they will want to consult you? They'll consult us, and we obviously will strongly um, recommend that you have a very controlled level of liberalization. Because of our strategic value to the country. Okay. Let's talk about Australia and New Zealand uh, passengers uh, in, inbound demographics. Uh, what's the market like currently and uh, so in the it, future? It changes from time to time. So pre COVID and today has changed. But if I look, for example, I jotted down here Australia, the, the bulk of the traffic coming in is in the age group of 35 to 50. And here's an interesting fact. 55% are female, and we see a lot of women groups coming in, you know, small teams coming in and having lots of fun. Of course, a lot of families, and so that's an interesting. It's a little bit different for New Zealand. Age group is a little older. It's closer to uh, 49 to 60, and in the case of Asia, it's much younger. It's 30 to 39, so we see a younger demographics coming from Asia. Hmm. We'll but we have the deal, there's a lot of detail on this which Tourism Fiji has if anyone's interested in getting it. Okay. Do you see this demographic uh, bringing business uh, in the uh, coming years or things may change? Well, remember the, the, that's one of the challenges we have as an airline is the bulk of our traffic we bring in our holiday makers, really little business traffic. So, so I think what you may see, we want younger people to come in the future. Mm -hmm. So it's one area that we're targeting on, mm -hmm. you know, to bring younger, the younger demographics in. But, but at this stage, we're happy with what we're getting. It's just that that's an untapped market for us, is the younger demographics. The code sharing you have with other airlines, uh, is that working fine uh, for the airline? Oh, it's very important. Mm -hmm. So we fly, for example, Fiji Airways, the international, to 23 direct destinations and with our 14 code share partners we expand the network where we fly to to 110 mm. and without those partners you wouldn't have all those destinations so it's made our business network much bigger mm. having code share partners thank you very much we'll take a short break and start uh, continue on the other side we were around when the deed was first signed we were around when the first car engine roared we were around when the very first was crowned. Through devastations, jubilant celebrations, and the milestones. We will continue to be around to bring you all the stories first. 
welcome back. And uh, today we are talking to Fiji Airways big boss, Andre Fulion. Uh, Andre, let's talk about uh, the uh, airline's recognition internationally. We understand the airline is now in the top 15 in the world with uh, Skytrax and Apex Awards. That's a major achievement for Yes, it is. So when I joined, as I mentioned, we were ranked 100th in the world, two and a half star. We've been following a very, very, I would say, specialist program that changed service culture in the company. It's the Up Your Service program from Ron Kaufman in Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, very well known uh, as a product for Singapore Airways, Marina Sands Hotel, Lux in Mauritius. And we've been following his program and, and that service culture change has resulted in us being ranked uh, four star by Skytrax, five star major airline by Apex, and as I mentioned, we've won earlier best airline uh, this year to uh, the Asia uh, or to the Pacific region. And so, yes, incredible for the company. Mm. We've seen Fiji Airways elevate from 2015 today to be ranked as a major <coughs> airline, and we're only an, air an airline with 21 aircraft. It's mm. quite an achievement. After you receive the awards, uh, do A New Zealand uh, or Qantas CEOs call you up to say, hey, job well done? Not at all. <laughs> so I always joke and say we have loving competitors. Uh, everything but that. They're serious competitors. Mm. And if anything, it's put a target on our back mm. um, for them to beat us. Mm. So no, no uh, complimentary calls, but certainly a target. <laughs> okay. The building outside at Namaka, the academy, the yes. Fiji Airways Academy, uh, I understand it's it was good investment and it's uh, reaping benefits. So Please explain uh, how. Th yeah. So it's a total game changer for us. Mm -hmm. So when I joined, I asked the question, why haven't we got an academy? And the logic is that there's a norm that says unless you have 10 aircraft of a type, you shouldn't consider buying a full flight simulator for that type. And then I looked at the, the stats in the company. We were spending 10 million US dollars a year paying third party mm. simulator facilities around the world. And also, more than 15% of our pilots on any one day were not working, they were in simulator centers around the world where you lose days flying, you got to wait for slots, and, and they, then when they come back, they got rest periods. And um, we decided to invest. And, and get a 330 full flight simulator, a max full flight simulator, and it's been a total winner. And in fact, with the third party work we're generating, it's paid itself off in three years. Mm -hmm. And it's an investment of close to $100 million. Mm -hmm. It's been a total game changer for us in this sense. It was commissioned in January 2020, mm -hmm. and it saved us during COVID. Mm -hmm. If we never had that facility, we would have been a grounded air. We wouldn't have restarted in January, sorry, December. 21 mm. it was a massive uh, positive for this company. I understand pilots from around the world are coming in there. Yes, we have a Canadian airline, we have a few Australian airlines, and um, an American airline mm -hmm. sending their pilots to train on the Max Simulator and also the 330. Mm -hmm. And we also have Air Kalin from New Caledonia sending their pilots here rather than Paris. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, f foreign reserves. I uh, understand uh, ticket sales uh, contributes yeah. towards uh, the country's foreign reserve. Uh, yeah. The Reserve Bank governor looks after the foreign reserves. Yes. Uh, explain how. Yes, yeah, so I, I say if you look at Fiji Airways' strategic value to the country, first of all, we bring in 70% of the tourists. Also, we are the airline that creates new destinations. Foreign airlines that fly here don't create new destinations. We do. We go and explore where there's traffic and bring it. Now, here's the, the bottom line benefit to the country. Not only do we bring the tourists in, but every ticket sold on Fiji Airways the revenue flows into the country as reserves. Mm -hmm. If it's bought on a foreign airline, not a cent comes in. Mm -hmm. And that's our real value. So this year, we'll be generating about 1.9 billion in sales that will be flowing into the country. Mm -hmm. There's ticket bookings, then there's ticket sales. Uh, yeah. Explain how that works. Uh, when does the dollar kick in? So, so what happens is when you buy a ticket, uh, it's what we call a booking and a sale. It's the same thing. Yeah. When you fly, it's taken from sales to revenue. And then we, so we distinguish sold to flown. Yeah. 
and it only becomes revenue when you fly because when you when you buy a ticket we debit cash with if you take the accounting we bring in the cash and we create a liability called unflown sales when you fly we transfer it from the liability to revenue and then it becomes revenue mm -hmm. so so we distinguish between sales and revenue mm -hmm. Nobody talks about airline industry, Fiji Airways contributing towards the foreign reserves, they talk about sugar. Uh, why is that? Well, I suppose because when you look at exports, they think, you know, they talk of sugar exports, but every tourist is an export. Mm. And, and we, as I say, are 70% of that export. Mm. So every time you meet the Reserve Bank of Fiji governor, he is yes. happy with your performance? He's very interested mm. and, and obviously um, assists us wherever he can and how we manage our foreign currency. So we're very happy and have a very good relationship and we respect him. He's doing a great job. Mm. We'll talk about COVID-19 uh, uh, next week, but yeah. uh, let me just ask you about a moment where the company needed money and yes. you went out looking for money and there were no lenders putting up their yeah. hand. So in the first, I would say, six to nine months when there was all that uncertainty of when we're likely to open and how long it will last, uh, the fact that we'd shut down and then the whole world had gone into a lockdown. Um, if you remember, borders closed. Um, all the local banks we approached at the time uh, were not interested in lending money to an airline. Mm. And I always joke and said they ran into the hills. And I used to drive in the morning to work and pass the, the giant lying outside here, the giant mountain there, and say I could see their hair sticking up in the grass, all the bankers. And they got very upset with me when I said that because one of them in the newspaper said I insulted all the bankers. But mm. that's how I felt at the time. Mm. Did you come close to uh, shutting down this place? Yes, so, so we, when COVID hit us, our monthly recurring fixed cost that we were paying out every month was nearly 40 million, 39 million. And we had about 250 million in reserves. And you can work that out, that's four or five months. We had to take some extreme measures in the company to reduce our cash payments by getting deferrals, cutting costs, doing whatever we needed to. And I brought it down to 20. But even down at 20, 250 million does not give you two years. Mm. And at some point we were running out of cash. Mm. And, and uh, so here's a very important fact. Solvency is measured in two ways. It's measured in having enough cash to meet your further future obligations. And the second is that your balance sheet must remain positive, in other words, positive equity. Mm -hmm. So your assets less your liabilities. And we had to manage those two levers of solvency throughout. And, and uh, cash was our initial challenge. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to get loans eventually to make up the cash. And then obviously at some point an equity raise to manage the equity. Mm -hmm. Who were the saviors uh, the, who came forward to save the airline, if I had to ask you that question? Uh, at, uh, during the time of COVID. Right, so obviously at the time government had no cash, couldn't help us, but they did. Um, and, and I know this was taken to parliament and the first uh, agreement on this was unanimous to provide us with debt guarantees. This is an obligation um, to pay a lender that if in the future we can't pay a loan back. And that certainly was a positive that we could use to try and raise loans. The second is locally we had um, uh, a couple of the banks that eventually assisted us and, and the main lender in all of this was the ADB, the Asian Development Bank, mm. who um, provided us a 165 million loan mm. uh, with a lot of due diligence, a lot of pain, but uh, was a very important, uh, I would call it, um, partner mm. in helping us get through COVID. Mm. And uh, when did F uh, Fiji National Provident Fund come into the picture and what was their stake back then and what is their stake in the airline yes. now? So, so if you look at loans, we, we doubled our loans. So we had about 390 odd millions loans before COVID. We ended up with 700 by the end of COVID. Um, these loans we ensured we had 15 years to pay back. 
and uh, with a moratorium on capital payments for the first four years, so a lot of space. We had to restructure our debt as well. Um, we, we, one of the things we haven't spoken about is what helped us get the money in the end was being able to prove to bankers we could repay. Mm -hmm. And we developed a seven-year model with the assistance of BNP Paribas, a monthly detailed model that enabled us for different startup dates and different ramp-up profiles back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, we could assess whether we had debt cliffs, whether we needed what type of funding we had to raise, and also what reprofiling we had to do of existing debt. Mm -hmm. And all of that was done very well thanks to this model. Then we ran out, we knew by August 2021 we would run out of equity. Because even although you defer payments, you've still got the cost. And the PL still picks up the cost. Mm -hmm. and, and our equi starting equity at the beginning of COVID was 500 million. Mm -hmm. And by August 21, we'd run out of it and have a negative equity. And the negative equity is called a um, technical insolvency or an accounting insolvency. And to prevent that, we had to raise shares. Mm -hmm. So we did an equity capital raise of 200 million. BNP Paribus valued our shares in August 21 at $4.22 a share. That's a 74% discount over the value in 2016, mm -hmm. sorry, 2019 of $16 a share. And we then offered all the existing shareholders $200 million worth of shares at $4.22. Mm -hmm. Government took up their shares, but the other shareholders did not. And Qantas, who was a 46% shareholder, then diluted down to 16%. And the 30% they didn't take up, we offered to several institutions, including FNPF. FNPF were very interested because they were buying it at a 74% discount. Mm. And with their hotel investments mm. and the airline, there's a synergy mm. and saw an opportunity there. They did an extensive due diligence. And uh, I, I always joke and say they had 33 specialists running around at one stage checking everything. The only thing they didn't check is my underwear. Mm. But otherwise they checked everything. And, and eventually made the decision to acquire the shares. They took up 30% and um, today they've scored a lot. Um, the value of the shares today is up at around $11. So they've probably made more than 200 million already on their investment of 98 million. Mm. Andre, thank you very much for speaking to us. Uh, we will continue speaking to you in the part two of our discussion, which will air next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.